session is Martin Swilland, just from MIT next door. Yes. We are happy to listen to your talk. Thanks so much. Oh, it's working. Yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for, for having me. Thanks to the organizers. Um, and I, I love these type of workshops because um, the travel is kind of short. Um, I also <laughs> apologize though what this brings with you with, uh, with it that you, you actually end up teaching when usually would have taken off the day. Uh, so this morning I couldn't be here uh, due to that. I apologize. Um, so I'll tell you about uh, fermions under the microscope. Um, uh, the heroes of this work um, uh, are virtually present. They could also be here, but you know we really have to wrestle these results from nature. And now we had a power outage, the water cooling turned off, so they decided to just uh, be, be. Wait a second. Okay, one, two. Not so bad. Okay, great. So uh, half, fifty percent are there. So Thomas and and, and, and Gia are, are there. Um, great. Uh, this is this is cool. Um, so so. Uh, uh, these are the heroes of, of the work, and the, the, the papers over the last years um, were on um, uh, measuring double and hole correlations. I will uh, tell you a bit about this uh, shortly. Um, a slightly orthogonal topic is that we realized that we can take these fermion pairs, spin up and spin down, uh, starting with the Hubbard model, uh, and uh, make something completely different out of it, namely a quantum register of these fermion pairs. Uh, and, and most of the talk will be focusing about the observation of non-local fermion pairing in uh, the attractive uh, Hubbard model. So clearly in this audience I don't have to uh, motivate the excitement for strongly directing Fermi systems. Um, we are all united in, in that and we are also in this workshop united in trying to understand the, the Fermi Hubbard model, uh, which is of course um, uh, proposed as a, the, the, the simplest model that, that might explain high TC superconductivity. We heard that uh, uh, there the are increasing doubts that the plain vanilla <coughs> model can do it, so you might need a, um, a T prime, etc. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's a wonderful uh, problem to, to really uh, uh, fight, fight against and try to solve um, from theory and experiment. In Cold Adams, this has um, uh, by now quite a, uh, uh, an amazing history, and I, I think I just at some point ended up, um, like, I didn't have enough space anymore for adding the, the newest uh, works. It, it's, it's quite a remarkable en endeavor um, in, in Cold Adams, and here I'm just flashing uh, what is probably also not a complete set of uh, experiments that these days uh, can image fermions with single uh, atom resolution. Uh, and I have also this beautiful picture, which is not single atom resolved, but an absorption picture from a uh, uh, Fermi gas um, microscope. You see we don't run out of uh, color schemes uh, yet. Uh, this is a beautiful triangular lattice by, uh, by Peter, who is also around. Um, all of these are interestingly somehow connected by f uh, academic f family trees, so it's actually very interesting <laughs> to look at the uh, various connections between these groups. Um, uh, uh, a new twist uh, that uh, we developed a couple of years ago uh, was to be able to image the total density in these uh, gases. You might have heard or remember the problem that when you have two atoms on a site and you apply this uh, microscopy, then usually that, that's the end of the doublon that you have there and uh, you will not actually see it, it will show up as a whole. But uh, using a bilayer technique, we were able to separate um, these doublons into two two separate layers, so say the spin up goes one way, the spin down goes the other way, and we get then therefore uh, doubly uh, fluorescent sites uh, from this um, uh, initial double on site. So we can actually see, for example, here in the strongly correlated, strong, strongly interacting regime, a band insulator in, this, in the middle with dub doubly fluorescent sites indicating two atoms, uh, surrounded by a mod insulating <coughs> shell of unity filled atoms. And um, as you weaken the interaction strength, this is not sort of temperature going high, but instead the uh, system becomes uh, uh, more itinerant, more uh, delocalized, and this is a very interesting strongly correlated metal. Th there's a vast amount of information in these, in these images. You can, of course, look at the macroscopic properties, just look at you know, the density profile of these atoms in uh, the trap, and they tell you about the compressibility, the density, the pressure, to get, get the equation of state right out of these pictures. But you can also look at the microscopic correlations. So for example, you can immediately prove that you have fermions under your microscope, not bosons, 
by making sure that whenever you see one spin-up atom, another spin-up uh, spin, spin atom does not want to be a near nearby this first one. So it's, of course, they cannot be on top of each other in the single band realization of the Hubbard model, but they also don't want to even be nearby each other, and that's the famous Pauli hole that you can directly see under the microscope. Uh, more related to particularly Hubbard physics is these uh, instances where you see a doublon next to a hole. Doublon next to a hole. Next to a hole. These are doublon hole fluctuations um, that come about as you start forming singlets as an admixture of the wave function. I'll actually have two more slides on this, so I will say more about this. Uh, just uh, to mention what connects the microscopics and the macroscopics is the fluctuation dissipation theorem. So knowing the compressibility and knowing the density fluctuations, I can now have a theory-independent thermometer. I can just directly measure temperature from density fluctuations, which is, which is nice. You know, it's always good to sort of remove the dependence on uh, theoretical uh, models, because in the end it should be rather you know, uh, uh, independent determination, right? So let me uh, quickly flash on uh, what we can see with these double hole fluctuations. This is what you expect when you form lots of singlets at low temperature. Uh, to each of these singlets wave function, there's also a little bit of a double hole wave function at mixed uh, with an amplitude t over u. Uh, so you see them, if you're not too strongly interacting, they do appear in the snapshots of these experiments um, and can be, uh, can be measured. We can provide a, a map of these double hole correlations as a function of filling. Um, and um, you see that near the MOT insulator, these double on hole fluctuations, these next neighbor double on hole fluctuations are strongly enhanced. This is um, summarized here. This is sort of a G2 function for what's the probability to find a double on next to a hole, and there's a huge peak near half filling. And you can also check that the admixture of these double on hole fluctuations to your wave function, it goes with a probability T over U squared. Uh, as it should be from this from this simple idea up, up there. So it's nice that we can see these double hole fluctuations directly under, uh, 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 under the microscope, thanks to the imaging. But now let's actually extend the phase diagram going away from the, the repulsive Hubbard model to the attractive Hubbard model. Uh, this is a beautiful picture taken from Tillman's review. Uh, uh, from uh, 2010, uh, where you see there's a beautiful symmetry between repulsive and attractive. I will say more about this. And uh, this required for us to be able to not only image the density, but really the individual spin density, spin up and spin down, in one shot of the experiment. And the upshot is that we were now able to see uh, the evolution from well and non-attracting, uncorrelated, uh, well, still fermionic correlated, but not with interactions, state to metallic state, charge density wave patches pop up, and um, eventually, for strong attraction, you get basically a molecular gas of these dumbbells running around. So that will be the main part of, of the talk, uh, focusing on the attractive Hubbard model. Now to bring us all on, on the same page, um, this is a, a phase diagram that you might have seen also in the uh, works describing the observation of the BEC-BCS crossover in um, bulk systems, so three-dimensional bulk without a, without a lattice. Um, there's the, this, this beautiful story of the BEC-BCS crossover where you go, go from a BEC of tightly bound molecules to the barding cooper schrieffer superfluid of long-range Cooper pairs, smoothly tuning the attraction strength. And at finite temperature, um, you see that the critical temperature in the BEC regime is just given by whatever Einstein told us the degeneracy temperature scale is. But as you go to the BCS regime, you get this exponential suppression of, of TC. Even above TC, there is a very interesting regime of preformed pairs, which has sometimes also been called the pseudogap regime, which has a loose connection uh, to what we call the pseudogap regime in the repulsive um, Hubbard model. You can talk more about this. But it's, it's also sort of, it's a gap state. There's already um, pairing going on, but the pairs are not coherent yet. And there's a temperature T star that indicates where you start having these pairs. And of course, um, on the Bose molecular side of things, you're not surprised that you can make molecules that are not yet condensed. Now, uh, on the specific, specifically for the Hubbard model, um, 
there is a wonderful mapping between the repulsive Hubbard model and the attractive Hubbard model that I'm, I'm sure most, most of you are very familiar with, but it's still beautiful to just quickly remind us uh, what happens. Um, the, the mapping is simply as follows. The uh, spin downs, say the blue ones here, they will be swapped with a hole. The spin ups you don't touch. And there's a little subtlety that this works on bipartite lattices and you put a minus one at every second lattice side and so on. But then there's a direct mapping. For example, if you just have a, a mod insulator um, without any spin ordering, this is um, basically just a disordered uh, wave of these doublons running around on the attractive side of things. If you actually have antiferromagnetic ordering um, of your mod insulator, here like a Z antiferromagnetic depicted, you get an ordered charge density wave. Or I should also say what we uh, cannot represent so nicely if you have an X or a Y um, antiferromagnetic, that maps onto the XY order parameter of the superfluid phase on the attractive side of the thing. Um, if you uh, happen to have a D-wave superfluid, then you might actually expect some spin polarized charge density wave on the attractive Hubbard model side. So there's this one-to-one -one mapping and it's uh, equally uh, interesting to study the attractive side of things. And we thought maybe we gain a little bit in temperature if you go to the attractive side of things because that is, um, uh, naively speaking, the, uh, the ground state of the system whereas a repulse be being on a repulsive branch with our cold atoms means there is actually a molecular state lurking underneath that gave us this repulsion. So um, we felt maybe that's a good idea to go to um, the attractive side of things. One word about the spin imaging. Uh, that is uh, easy said, but uh, it, it takes forever to implement. It's a very sophisticated way of doing it, and I have to really uh, give, give credit to the, to the guys upstairs um, to, to have the perseverance to go through this. And um, in the end, uh, they are able to take an image of uh, one layer separately uh, without affecting the other layer. And what you then have to do is you really, through a Stangala separation, bring the spin ups upstairs, the spin downs stay downstairs and you can image first the spin ups for example without affecting the spin downs and then you image the spin downs. So this is the first image for example, you image the well spin up, um, that's the image, that's the digitization and you do another image for the spin downs, that's the image, that's the digitization and it's fun actually by eye to just go through and see ooh, how, how many of these guys are actually at the same place. And uh, of course, you can put it together using white denoting doublons, and red and blue would be the singles that are sprinkled around that uh, do not sit on top of each other. So now with this new imaging, we can uh, uh, explore a portion of the attractive fermi hubbard diagram. And in this talk, I will basically focus on the balanced gas and the end maybe give an outlook of what happens for spin imbalance. For the balanced uh, attractive Hubbard model, let me remind you uh, the uh, spin imbalance on the attractive side of things maps onto doping on the repulsive side of things. So if you have spin balance, that means we are looking at the half uh, filled undoped repulsive Hubbard model in the mapping. Uh, we can of course vary the doping on the attractive side. That means going away from half filling will be for the repulsive Hubbard model having a spin magnetization turned on. So studying the repulsive Hubbard model at half filling in the presence of a magnetic field is what we do when we work not at unity filling on the attractive side. Uh, the temperatures that we explored are about uh, 0.3 T and indicated by this band. So this is the region that we uh, explore in the experiment. Uh, we uh, as far as we know, have not crossed the critical temperature for superfluidity. By the way, if there is a critical temperature for superfluidity, you realize I'm not at half filling. We are at roughly 80% filling uh, with the majority of the gas. Um, so there is a TC expected. Um, it might be around 0.2, maybe a little bit lower, um, but we are sort of scratching at that. Um, but we are already in a re regime, as I will tell you, where we have strong superfluid and charge sensor wave correlations and definitely preformed pairs. So the picture is, is again, the, the one from the BCBCS crossover, at least um, <coughs> uh, roughly speaking. Let's do first things first, see what the doublon density does as a function of interaction strength. Um, 
So these are pictures for, for zero interaction strength. Of course, I take a snapshot. I will find a bunch of spin ups on top of spin downs just by chance, right? Uh, but as I start inc increasing the interaction strength, I get more and more of these doublons. Um, and um, if you close your eyes, squint your eyes, you see a little bit of some patterning, some sort of structure in these, in the uh, pattern of these doublons, and that's actually the charge density wave correlations uh, coming up. So these are actually experimental uh, points, and, and they're, uh, uh, actually later we put, up, put up on top of that some, some theory lines, they're just identical, and it's quite, quite nice. Um, and, and of course, very expected. You just get more and more doublons the, the stronger the interactions are. And this is for various fillings. It's quite hilarious. By tuning the doping of the attractive Hubbard model, I allowed myself to speak at the workshop on the doped Hubbard model, even though I admit that the, without spin imbalance, this is not attacking the question of uh, the uh, sign problem in Monte Carlo, etc. Right? Yeah. Um, so uh, how do the snapshots look like? For example, for strong interactions, you get lots of these white dots indicating doublons. There are sprinkles of spin-ups and spin-downs around. Every once in a while, you see patches where there's kind of a charge density wave order lurking around. And um, I, I will argue um, and, and basically prove to you that these um, red, blue dots that are circled here, it's a very suggestive, um, they are actually fluctuations coming from uh, uh, from a, a pair that has decided to break up uh, virtually and form a uh, up-down separated pair for a little while and we caught it in that moment. So it's actually the analogous thing to the double and hole fluctuations on the repulsive Hubbard model. Um, and I will talk more also about, about the charge density wave. Here's a snapshot for uh, uh, slightly weaker interactions, U over T of, of roughly 6. You see way more of these spin-ups and spin-downs and just from this picture you will not know are they paired up or are they just like, is it just a hot soup? Um, is this all by chance or, or what's going on? So we will have to look at correlations, of course. This is a very suggestive rendering where we, for, by, for fun, ha, you know, uh, uh, thought, oh, who could be paired up with whom, right? Yeah. And uh, that's, of course, not what the snapshot gives you, but it's very suggestive. <laughs> so let's see uh, what we can learn from studying these correlations. That means we repeat, repeat, repeat the same experiment over and over again and compare um, the many snapshots together. So this would be one snapshot of that particular interaction strength, which is zero. And there is already correlation. What's going on? Well, that's the famous Pauli hole. That's simply that you know, once I have a fermion on one side, then I will not have a fermion of that same spin on a neighboring side. I will have a strong su suppression for that. So there's a hole roughly of one, one letter side spacing. In this, uh, in this system. As I now increase the attraction, I get actually a larger sort of correlation window, um, which is a combination of the attractive interaction between the atoms and the Pauli principle. And again, this is totally suggestive <laughs> uh, and, and, and a cartoon, you know, where we just try to connect which ones could be paired up. The, but this is actually a snapshot of the experiment. It's just like the shading that's our, that's our dream. Um, Virtual pair fluctuations show up in the strongly interacting regime um, where you have, um, so this is for 8.4, um, where you have very few of these loners around, but then when they are few, then you see like, okay, they usually show up next to each other, very similar to these double and both fluctuations. Again, a single shot doesn't prove anything, but the correlations tell the story. You see that the correlations become very short-ranged. You only have next neighbor correlations. Um, and they vanish um, as they should uh, with a probability given by the square of, of uh, t over u. Martin? Yeah? Um, so the averages, correlations that you're showing, are they over the whole system, or do you only take it in the center to avoid edge effects? We can do, we can do both. So the system is rather large, so we can actually allow ourselves to do sort of a spatially varying uh, average binning with respect to density, but here indeed what we did is just look at the central large patch where we have roughly 80 percent filling. Okay, right, right. sorry, I missed. Is this in a harmonic trap or flat trap? The, uh, 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 we can do both, <laughs> uh, but this is still there is still some curvature around, um, so we have actually some variation in the density, but in the center it's it's very flat, and so basically in that region uh, we we get what what is corresponds to 80 percent filling. Uh, so how, how can we actually prove that these guys are, are, are paired? Um, 
from these correlators? Well, it's very simple. If the sum of the spin fluctuations um, over space is zero, that means wherever there's a spin up, I will find the spin down partner that it had paired with. And um, it's very simple, like for example, these guys uh, on site gives me uh, uh, yes, a plus one for having this red guy and a minus one if there's also a blue guy nearby. So if I sum over the whole space and I get zero, I know I have a paired gas. And if it's non-zero, I know I have, um, well, maybe a bunch of pairs, but I, I don't know, maybe there's some, some uh, excitations on top. And so that's basically what you just do. You just probe the magnetization fluctuations, so the sum over these images, the sum over the magnetization fluctuations, and look, when does this become zero? And indeed, it does become zero beyond an interaction strength on the order of six or so uh, for our temperatures, where we lose all the magnetization fluctuations and the, the gas is therefore fully paired. The gray data, by the way, that would be just the on-site fluctuations. So you have to, of course, um, uh, look at non-local contributions to see the full suppression of the spin fluctuations. Martin? Yeah. That, there is also maximum to that, right? If you have, I mean, you just have you have the number of, of ups and down spins in the total system are conserved, or not? So, so, mm -hmm. so it, it sums up approximately to zero always, up to the ones that you cut in your analysis region. Ah, um, well. So, 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 so uh, this is still in in uh, in a box that is in contact with some even larger box. So the box that we use to sum the uh, spins in, that is not uh, a box that by definition has zero spin fluctuations, right? It's not that we, we control the total number yeah, of spins so, so in so that smaller box. So something like square root right. of the number of sides you cut on the, uh, on the edge gives you a scale. For sort of, right, sort exactly. Of, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. Okay, so so, so that's, that's totally right, yeah. So now we can also ask, you know, what is so what is the, uh, the, the range of these pairs? So they're highly non-local. I, I mentioned, right, these, the, uh, now we know we have zero total spin fluctuation. That means uh, each of these dots is actually connected to another, uh, so, so each of the red dots is connected to some blue one. We, of course, don't know which one, uh, but they are all connected and are all paired up at our temperatures and, and at this interaction strength. And it's really rather non-local, so it extends, you know, a few sites. You know, it's nothing uh, uh, dramatic, like ten sites or something, but it's a it's a healthy non-local correlation. The interparticle spacing is roughly the dashed line here, which is not surprising on the order of one interpart one lattice site. So this correlation extends way above beyond uh, the interparticle spacing. Um, the local fluctuations. Uh, uh, are simply re related to the singlon fraction. They are simply the, you know, how, uh, related to how many singlons do we actually have in the images, and that's again this t squared over u squared at mixture, or probability given by the t over u at mixture to the wave function, and so this is the data as a function of interaction strength, and the gray line is the expected scaling for that uh, at mixture, and it works out. Have you also I summed up this um, the fluctuations with some, let's say, envelope function and changed the width to basically extrapolate from the local ones and these full boxes that Christian mentioned? We did, in fact, um, a patch. You know, um, uh, we we had such a large system that we could actually bin for density yeah. and still get enough, you know, data because the correlations are also not gigantic, right? So with a three-side window, you can actually already get a pretty good idea of what your correlation function is and get sufficiently uh, enough, uh, uh, large enough region that you actually already have the full fluctuations in. Uh, in both. So actually we have plots of these, which I didn't bring in this talk, but we have plots of these correlators versus density as well. Um, but the box is really, I mean, gigantic compared to the correlations here. So we actually have a large... Um, yeah, large I guess that's what I'm asking. Is if you change the size of your window or envelope, right, you could figure out how large are the pairs, right? By looking at how small... It's roughly this, right? That's what it is. It's the, it's the range of the correlations between, between the magnetic moments here. That's what we do here. Yeah. So that's, that's already what, what you can get from this, from this correlation plot directly. Exactly. So, so our point is this is actually many-body pairing. It involves multiple spins. And by the way, there's also simple calculation you can do on the two-particle pairing, like how much 
would be the binding energy for two particle pairs, they would still be exponentially suppressed at this interaction strength and we, we should not see two body pairs at our temperatures in this regime. So we rely on enhancement of the pairing. Now with the pair formation, the question is, is there pair order? Now we cannot directly measure superfluid correlations, but we can measure charge density wave correlations, sort of the equivalent of the Z interferometer on the repulsive side of things. Uh, and we can take this as a proxy for superfluid correlations because we are away from half filling, so charge density wave correlations should be suppressed compared to superfluid correlations, which at zero temperature give me the uh, superfluid. So charge density wave correlations are um, abundantly present and um, rather uh, long, long scale, a couple of lattice sides wide. Um, so th there is a correlation in the, uh, between the pairs. Uh, it's quite beautiful to just take the Fourier transform of these correlators and see a strong peak at pi pi, um, showing you the checkerboard order of these, of these pairs. And uh, then you can also take a cut versus momentum and see a strong peak at, at pi pi. The, the black line would be, or is, the black line is measured for a non-ejecting uh, non system. And it's sad and boring, but so interactions give you this very nice enhancement. Um, we can... Uh, plot the Fourier transfer, of course, versus interaction strength, and you see there's, just, there's a nice peak uh, near an interaction strength of six or, or so. This is plotted here, where we take this order parameter, if you allow me to call it that, at pi pi, you know, this peak value, and just plot it versus interaction strength, and there's a nice peak at the regime where the interaction is around six, seven, eight, where the correlations are strongest in this, in this gas. Um, you, you can either report the density uh, correlations, chi n here, or you just directly plot the correlations between up and down spins, uh, that's chi up, up down because of s spins having spin factor of one half, you, you multiply by four, it's basically roughly the same thing. It's just that zero interaction, there's absolutely no up down correlator, while, this, while the Pauli hole still gives you a non-zero density. Uh, correlator. So there's a small difference uh, here that is very, very much physics related. Okay, I want to know. Um, one comment back to the temperature. Uh, okay, yeah, sure. I'm just curious, can you do pi over 2 pulse between the two species? In this case, I like, assume... I can, we have not done it, but yeah. Then if this is possible, then I think you can map uh, Superconducting relations and density. Yes, we have we've thought about tricks tricks like that. I think I think it's no, not quite work. right. No, you cannot rotate it up to superconductivity. Exactly. So it's hilarious. On the interferometry side of things, for the repulsive Hubbard model, I can convert a Z interferometer into an X interferometer. Awesome, right? But on the uh, attractive side of things, I cannot do the same operation. It's not an RF uh, drive that I uh, should use. Um, it's a complicated thing that involves two particles. So it's a two particle operator that I have to apply, with, which I don't have in, in my hands. I mean, there are some, some tricks and some thoughts how to do it, um, but it's, it involves two particles. Uh, uh, because the C, the uh, RF would be C up dagger, C down, but now we have to turn the C down into C down dagger. So I have to have an operator that's like C up dagger, C down dagger, so I have to suddenly create two particles somewhere. I cannot do that. <laughs> so it's tough. But, but it's, it, it's great to start thinking about this. Yeah. Um, a word on, on thermometry. So uh, I mentioned we have the density fluctuations. We can measure the compressibility precisely because we can have a harmonic trap confinement giving us the compressibility. And so we have a direct measurement of temperature. And um, it's 0.3-ish uh, T uh, in, the, in the regime of strong interaction. So it's, it's quite cold. Uh, and again, I mentioned it's uh, uh, probably 50% um, too hot to be superfluid. So, so we have hopes if uh, power is back on at MIT and the cooling water is and the diet doesn't break, and, you know, then we might actually get colder. Yeah. Your temperature looks uh, from 0 to 15 U constant within a factor of 2 or so. Naively, I would have expected the entropy to be constant, but not the temperature. Well, it, is this constant or is this varying? Well, <laughs> it's, 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 like, it's less it's than a factor of two, and you're changing U by a ton. Yeah. Right? So it's, uh, what, 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 yeah. 
that's what we do, that's what we get. It's like a <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Martin, should there be higher order band effects? Upper band effects? No, and I don't think so. That we have kept out the higher order band sufficiently. Uh, 15 U over T, I thought that you would see something. And what would we see? Um, I, I'm not sure. That, that was the question. Are there such any effects you? that you've seen? Mm -hmm. You, you mean we, we mix bands? Well, let's not, let's not wonder about, you know, the, if we are on the attractive side of things, if you have very strong attractive view, uh, that, uh, yeah, formally that means, oh, I mix, I mix higher bands, but really what you're doing, you just form a tighter and tighter uh, pair on, on a given site. You know, it's, it's nothing sort of unnatural that, that uh, would show up in, in weird ways. It's just like still a local pair. Even if you if would suddenly project it maybe on, on and you do band mapping, maybe you would say, like, oh, it actually has a mixture of higher bands. But if you just uh, carefully split this pair into two pieces and image spin up and spin down separately like we do, you would still see it as, as a happy double on. So I think it's sort of innocent, uh, even if we have some admixture of the higher bands. Nothing? Uh, cool. Uh, yeah. Um, what do we do? I think you were first. I don't know. So you need a thermometer. Is there a limit to how low in temperature you can go and this thermometer is still be useful? Because I imagine that you, at some point, you just don't get very many, many density. Like, like right, exactly. So then, then the, the, the limit is the patience of the, of the students, how many <laughs> pictures they want to take. <laughs> uh, how reprodu reproducible the machine is. So can I actually take a set of thousand data shots and call them all like representative? <laughs> um, that's certainly a limit. Then also, um, you have, uh, we, we saw an issue here is um, the, the total number fluctuations that you get from shot to shot just because your experiment is not hyper, super reproducible for the total atom number, right? So you have to carefully take that out. And uh, so we estimated in the, um, in, in the first work when we did this that we have a uh, easily 0.1 T could, could be, uh, um, so that's sort of easy limit, but then it, it, indeed for the reasons you give becomes harder and harder uh, to, to give it temperature. Yeah. So, so this fluctuation thermometry is great. I mean, if, I, if we want... I learned it from you. Actually, I took Antoine's <laughs> course when I was, I don't know, very small. <laughs> in, in Paris, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> well, you say it. <laughs> I forgot all about it. But if we wanted to use this for positive view, right? We did, yeah. Uh -huh. But don't we run into a problem that the compressibility now is quite small? Uh, well, true, true. Do but we if have your to system, it speed, uh, so or? absolutely true. But if if you have a again, the harmonic trap sometimes is, is useful for you because you might actually have your uh, okay. uh, almost incompressible system still in contact with uh, yes. wings where the density is sort of ha uh, a quarter filled only, and then you have still a very nice uh, indicator. So the are similar in the positive. Right. Case. So so uh, that 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 is the that is the trick. Indeed, you're right. Like for the incompressible state, yeah, it's a very small signal, but you go away from it and okay. you, you get a very nice signal still. Yeah. Right, yeah. Good, so th uh, these are just brought, you know, just for, for you know, uh, getting some feel for what happens to the density correlations uh, as you increase U over T. By I, you see it, um, of course, as well, but here we report it versus, versus distance. As you increase U over T, the uh, density correlations uh, first grow to this maximum, right near near six or eight, and then they seem to shrink a little bit again at higher U. Uh, for this spin correlations, it's sort of the, the opposite. You start already for non attracting gases to have already some correlations. That's this Pauli hole, and then it shrinks and shrinks uh, and becomes this tiny little admixture of next neighbor correlations uh, from from the very tightly bound bond doublon pair, almost a doublon, um, in the high, uh, strongly attractive uh, regime. Um, do I have a... Yeah, you have like some three, three more three minutes. Three minutes. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Great. So, so then I can tell you one thing about higher order correlators, and the, uh, the larger number than two is three. Okay, so this is going to be a three order correlator. Um, and it's very much related to the repulsive magnetic polaron. Um, by, by Christian and, and company. Um, and uh, what happens uh, if you have some, some interesting charge density wave, for example? 
you could have a pair fluctuation where a loner decides to split off from its, from its partner and mess up this, uh, uh, this order, and then it even decides to tunnel the mean person and the tunnel further over, and it messes up um, the, the order. Um, very analogously, uh, you can also have a superfluid uh, correlation be messed up by this uh, uh, tunneling process, which actually ends up with a flipped superfluid phase uh, once these two partners have um, split uh, sufficiently. So uh, we should see a difference between the normal background correlations and correlations disturbed uh, next to a loner of, say, spin up, right? So we should um, condition our correlators on the presence of such loners and see whether the charge density wave correlations are suppressed. Let's first train our eyes on the bare correlations. Um, so <coughs> this is basically a, a, an ingredient of the big peak in the charge density wave order that we have seen here for the uh, next neighbor correlators. The moment we have uh, an extra spin uh, nearby, this strong peak is suppressed for this correlator. If we look at the diagonal correlator, it also is suppressed basically to nothing anymore. And if you have the 2-0 correlator two sides away, uh, that even is reversed in sign by the presence of a spin-up atom um, in between. So this is an example of a three-point correlator that we can get from these data. You can make a, a map um, of the effect, the size of the effect, which is uh, the presence of this loner minus the absence of the loner divided by the background, and you get sort of an idea of the size of this charge density wave <coughs> polar on, as, as we call it in, in the absence of another name. Um, so it also can be uh, shown as a function of distance just to get an idea of the extent of this polar on uh, in the charge center wave. Uh, this is actually only a beginning of the taste of what we should, should be looking for. We should, of course, also look at uh, four-point correlators where we have uh, a loner of spin up, a loner of spin down, and maybe a double and hole correlator, etc. All these can be obtained from uh, the images. Of course, the higher order you go, the more data you have to take. So that's the summary of this, of this work. Uh, we observed non-local fermion pairing seen in the suppression of the total magnetization fluctuations. Uh, this comes in the presence of a strong enhancement of the charge density wave correlation. So it's nice to be able to see the competition of these things, or the competition, or, or like how, how the interplay of pairing and charge density wave uh, plays out, at least here for the attractive Faber model. And we observe this uh, charge density wave polarum. This is again the map. Um, just as a little outlook, uh, we can also imbalance the, the gas. And now I'm really um, allowed to speak here because this is a sign problem. Uh, this gets a sign problem. I can, if you have questions, I can tell you more about this data. It's quite, quite a fascinating uh, situation. It's sort of the uh, mapped <coughs> version of the TJ model of the repulsive harbor model. It's actually a strongly interacting hardcore Bose Fermi mixture that, that appears. So with that, I want to go back to thank uh, these guys, um, which is the entire group um, here in terms of names and you for your attention. Thank you, Martin, for this wonderful talk. So we have some time for questions. Fabian. Uh, so the polaron that you looked at in the end, was it in a regime where still these one loner is bound to the other loner? Because then if we translate it, it should rather be an exciton in the, right, the yeah. passive language. So, so uh, gut feeling is yes. Um, to prove it, we would have to take more data to have yeah. more statistics. Yeah. Yeah. But, but the gut feeling is yes, actually. They are, these are all still very t close to each other. Um, and, and yes, so the, we should go for the higher order correlator. But you can't put the spin and balance yeah. systems and then it will not be. And then it will not, then there's no chance to. But, well, then there's a reduced chance to find the other guy nearby here. It would be amazing to see how this compares to Christian's results then, right? Because it's not the same, uh, you know, it should be the same if you have extra excess upspins. Uh -huh. Right, right. But then it would be a, a, direct, a direct mapping, right? Then because that would correspond to doping. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The size looks very similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they always do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Eugene? Actually, I want to go. But Pavel's question about rotating superfluid to CDW, as you said, by half doesn't work, but what is known to work for spin systems, if 
think about, you start with a spin order in plane, and now imagine you start winding it. That makes it unstable when it tries to unwind by going into the other direction. Yeah. <laughs> so can we, you start with a superfluid phase and do chirping so that the lattice start moving, yeah. and then you should see that this sort of immediately CW pops up. Beautiful, yeah. So that's actually, on, on, on our minds, we could also think about um, having sort of a density gradient so there's some region where we know the superfluid order should, should be dominant, right? Because of the, let's say you're 80% filling, uh, the charge density wave should be suppressed, but maybe you, you induce a I current. Would, yeah, actually, I want to start pushing. Right, to push them. Accelerate. Yeah. Uh, it's just like for bosons, right? Remember they were doing this <coughs> sort of right. finite momentum to superfluid, but in that case, they saw losses. In this case, because you could pile up many bosons. Here it's probably different because these are hardcore bosons, but what I would expect is that you get a competing Absolutely. type of water. So that's what we, what we also think, like if you, have some, if you, if you induce some current of this, of this gas, I think it would be good to have it so in, into a region where the density then is, is, is greater, so near, near half filling, where the charge density wave anyways would be, would be preferred. You should actually start to see this, this uh, right. excursion into the sort of the Z space into the charge density wave. Yeah. I mean, usually it shows up as some kind of instability of the spin system towards with a certain correlation. Okay, right. No, I think this is it. Like trans transport would be would be the thing in the end. There's one question at the back. Just yeah. curiosity. I mean, so unlike the repulsive Hubbard model, the attractive Hubbard model can be simulated very efficiently with quantum Monte Carlo, even at finite doping. Uh, huh? So I, is that useful for anything, like as a benchmark, or maybe also as a way of fitting to a temperature or something like that? Right, right, right. So, so um, I, I would like to qualify. Um, uh, repulsive and attractive is equally hard, taking all possible excursions um, together. So if you go not only away from half filling, but you also magnetize, it's as complicated. Uh, the, the two things are as complicated. So but of course, if you are spin balanced, <coughs> then the attractive Hubbard model is sign problem free, right, right. and the uh, repulsive uh, has. And of course, we, we did this. So for the sign, uh, for, for the spin receptivity, for example, we, we we ran you know this quest code that you can just oh, download and uh, to check that this magnetization fluctuations are indeed what you expect. Um, I didn't emphasize it because. Always a bit, you know, sad if it's I'm like, uh, you know, theory explains everything we do. We're not in a regime at the moment where we challenge theory, but with spin imbalance, I think we are <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. But I guess what I mean, could you also use it to, like, for instance, try to get, you know, infer the temperature in a regime where this other thermometry technique is more challenging? Right. Yeah. Maybe. I, I'm, I'm, I haven't compared the, the, the methods because that usually relies on some fitting in some region. Uh, yeah. Mm. Which, which might also be, be difficult precisely for the same reasons that the theory independent way is, is difficult. But it's, it is super helpful. Don't get me wrong. When there is theory in the regime where we are, it's very nice to, to, to have it. Right. Of course. Marcus? Um, um. Yeah, the so spin-ups are up there. <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the spirit of this being a workshop, let me ask a little broader question, maybe not just to you, but uh, to, to everyone, and, and also inspired by the, uh, the whole set of talks. So what I really, really love about this uh, positive-negative view kind of uh, uh, correspondence here is that you see, like, for a repulsive Hubbard model, you just have a uh, it's actually <coughs> you just have a Heisenberg magnet. Doesn't matter in what direction the nail order shows, like uh, the points, like y or x or uh, uh, um, or z, right? Uh, but in this mapping, right, uh, for the attractive model, uh, the, um, um, the z Heisenberg interfer magnet maps to the charge density wave, and the x y maps just the superfluid of pairs, right? And Naively, you would think charge density, the discharge order, and the superfluid is kind of the opposite. But here in this example, we see that the exact same thing. <laughs> okay, there is no difference between these dry, uh, this this charge density wave and a superfluid of pairs. Right. Um, I was just wondering sometimes if we talk about it in the whatever this high TC uh, strive phase, is it obvious that the superconducting phase 
and the stripe phase are really complete, completely opposite things, or are they somehow related, or maybe even um, two sides of a coin that, uh, uh, like, yeah, sure, it's not as you choose the metric, so depending on details, you know, one or the other may win, kind of just as if we had a Heisenberg magnet where you have a little bit of a magnetization Z or X or whatever, right? So then you would prefer. But is it to be a stupid question to ask if there's any relationship between these stripe phases and uh, V wave superconductivity? There's a special point where you can make a relationship for the repulsive Hubbard model, which is you take the spin fluctuation theory. Yep. And you go to the very low energy limit near the hot spot, you know, the hot spot model, we call the model. Yep, yeah, yeah. And in that limit, there is a equivalent, say, as a symmetry to T wave pairing and a certain chart. Test. So, would that be, like, can I think of this in a similar way? Yeah, way that, it's connected. That you kind of, uh, like, here you have mm -hmm. like stripes of pairs and BC of pairs. Yeah, and but, so there, but, then but you just have a little bit larger Cooper pairs that either for form the, stripes or a superfluid. Or yeah, yeah, I mean, it's similar. I mean, it's all, but it's only for the spin fluctuation mediated interaction near the hot spots. So for example, there's no Hubbard U in that theory. <laughs> well, you put in a Hubbard U, immediately break the difference. So, so, but I think there is a direct analogy for Hubbard U. It's just a statement that the stripe phase is mapped into the full deferral phase. So like, if you can map negative U of all the Ferrell for spin imbalance, it would be the same as the stripe phase uh, mm -hmm. I think for, for the positive U. Mm -hmm. Can you rotate CDW and superconductivity for the ro repulsive U of Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you rotate, if you go through this mapping, then you'll see that the analog of the, like what is uh, a stripe phase, uh, right? So we can, just basically say it's anti ferromagnetic order with anti phase domain, right? And that's exactly the full deferral. And then there is like charge, a different like charge, like a river of charge in between them. And that's like in full deferral, you get anti phase domain for superconductivity and a river of, uh, of magnetization. Okay, so that's the difference. So, so there is an exact mapping. So, in principle, all the same phases are present in the positive and negative U model. And I think the analog of D wave superconductivity would be D density wave, if I remember correctly. Yeah. 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 I, I think Marcus was balance breaks but that's that's asking if, if you keep U yeah. positive, yeah. is there a mapping between, uh, um, like, is there sort of a rotation between the uh, various phase. charge ordering yeah, phases and the D wave, yeah. right? Right, so because they have the answers similar energies, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah maybe not for a, uh, maybe it's not coincidental, right? right. That's my question. Is it coincidental that they have suspiciously uh, <laughs> yeah. similar energies and appear kind of somehow together, right? Or is it maybe similar to what happens on the positive view here, where right. I have <coughs> this, this real relationship between yeah. something that seems opposite, exactly. <laughs> charge order, superfluid, right? But it's the exact same thing. Because it's the same thing. So I also thought I should, you know, we should go through these data and just analyze in terms of sort of patches. I think by eye, I want to see that there's some charge energy wave patches then it sort of becomes boring again, like the, the, but, but that boring stuff is the superfluid that I'm not right, seeing. And then it goes back to yeah, charged exactly. energy waves, so they're like these meandering patches, and of course at lower temperatures they should order, and in fact we should see sort of, I think the analog of, we should see stripes, charged energy wave, nothing, charged energy wave, nothing, stuff like that, right? Just make one comment, if you have like a, it doesn't matter whether you're positive view or negative view, but if you a tiny bit of disorder, it'll mm -hmm. kill the CDW, correspondingly the stripe phase, cool. and it will reveal, I mean, the, the superconducting phase on the positive view or the mm -hmm. attractive view will become more robust. Thanks so much. That, that's a beautiful so suggestion, that, yes. That's one way to get back what we care about. Yeah, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so one last question. No? Okay. Yeah, so it, <laughs> Hi, Martin. Um, I had a question about your comment, how it was experimentally easier to get to low temperature, like 0.3 T on the attractive side, because on the repulsive side, your metastable the molecules, the true ground state. But I guess my gut feeling, although I never put any numbers, is that that matrix element is so tiny, and it would take a long time to decay. 
into molecules. So could you comment on that? And is that really what limits you? Or if you just tune to repulsive view, you could still get the same temperature? Right, so I think um, experimentally we haven't studied too much, starting from this, going to the repulsive side three, is try to see whether we are as cold. I, I think so many things have been optimized by these guys up there over the last uh, years that the point three, I cannot tell you now, is that because we went to the attractive or because like everything is much better than before. Before, on the, on the repulsive side of things, we were stuck at T over T of like maybe one-ish, yeah, 0.9 on a good day. And, and now for attractive, we are for breakfast, if uh, the MIT keeps their juice up, uh, we are point three. So, but I, I would imagine it could be also just the entire system improved a lot over, over, over the years. Okay, so let's thank Martin again.